Hey, it's holiday season, and it's also always horror season, so I guess I may as well cover a holiday horror movies iceberg. So this iceberg is just gonna be about movies that are horror movies that also have a holiday element like Christmas or Thanksgiving or something like that. Pretty straightforward, I just don't wanna waste any of your time, so that's why I'm going so quick here. Also, before we get into this, be sure to follow my Instagram and join my Discord because that is how you can stay updated with my channel. And also my Discord is just a great community for people. There are some actual cool people in there. There are also some not cool people in there, you know, but <laughs> not saying any names. Anyways, also I wanna shout out my friend real quick. He actually made me this iceberg for this video, which is awesome. He's a great dude. I'll link his channel in the description. He makes some great horror content. And oh, wait, 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 one more thing, one more thing. Only 1% of you guys are actually subscribed to my channel, which is kind of insane. And you should just subscribe, you know, just, you, you just should, you should do it. It's free, you know? Don't you want to get that percentage up? That's right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's get straight into this iceberg. Thanksgiving. This movie is like a deep dive into a twisted horror version of the holiday. Set in Plymouth, Massachusetts, where the whole Thanksgiving shebang started in the first place, it's got this small town vibe, but with a bloody twist. The plot's wild, shoddy. After this insane Black Friday riot goes down at Wright Mart, the town's never the same. Fast forward a year and you've got this psycho dressed like Pilgrim John Carver, the first big boss of Plymouth Colony. This dude's on a rampage, deciding to make his own kind of festive spread out of the townsfolk. Talk about a holiday special, but make it horror. The main people in this crosshair are the Wright family, Thomas Wright, the dude who owns Wright Mart, his new wife Kathleen, his daughter Jessica, and her squad. They're trying to piece together who this crazy pilgrim is while dodging his carving knife. It's like a classic whodunit but soaked in blood and Thanksgiving gravy. Jessica's smart though. She hatches this plan to bait the killer during the town's Thanksgiving parade. But bruh, things go south quick. Carver's going all incognito in a clown costume, drugs and nabs the Wrights and Jessica's buddy Scuba. This is where director Eli Roth cranks up the horror. Carver's hideout is Thanksgiving hell, pretty much. He cooks Kathleen like she's the turkey and goes full psycho with the rest of them. He has them like tied up live streaming this gruesome feast. But Jessica, she's got a trick up her sleeve. A bladed ring from McCarty, this chill dude who's like straight out of dazed and confused. Jessica and Scuba bust out, but not without some close calls and twisted ankles. Jessica ends up at the parade warehouse thinking her ex, Bobby, is the killer. But plot twist, it's actually Sheriff Newland, the dude who's supposed to be the good guy. He's got this vendetta against the whole town's elite all because of a tragic love affair turned deadly during the riot. Jessica, being one step ahead, live streams Newland's whole villain monologue. They end up in this mad chase through the warehouse with Jessica and Bobby trying to escape in his truck. They pull this epic move with a blow-up turkey, setting off an explosion that they think takes out Newland. But director Roth leaves us hanging. Jessica's safe, but she's got these nightmares, hinting that the Thanksgiving killer might still be out there. The whole movie wraps with this vibe that says, this ain't over. Also, this movie has Addison Rae, that one uh, famous, uh, musically star? Krampus. This is not your cozy, feel-good Christmas movie. Not nah, bruh, it's like a holiday horror show. It all starts with the Engel family. They're the typical Christmas movie gang, a bit dysfunctional, kind of stressed, but hey, it's the holidays. Young Max, he's the heart of the family, still believing in all that Christmas magic and stuff. But the family, men they're all over the place. Arguing, fighting, straight up ruining the holiday vibe. Max is fed up, like, yo, can we just have one nice Christmas? But nope, his letter to Santa gets ripped up and his Christmas spirit goes out the window. And that's where things get crazy. Enter Krampus, this ancient demonic beast of Christmas. Think of him like Santa's evil twin. He shows up when folks lose their holiday spirit and he's not here to spread cheer. He's all about punishing the naughty, and the Engel family's just made his list. This creepy snowstorm hits the town, trapping the family inside. It's wild, because now they're not just dealing with family drama, they're facing off against Krampus and his freaky squad. We're talking twisted toys, sinister snowmen, and elves that are more nightmare than nice. The family's gotta pull it together to survive Krampus's twisted games. It's like a test. Can they rediscover their holiday spirit in time to save themselves? The movie's packed with suspense, a bit of dark humor, and loads of chilling moments. Krampus flips the script on the whole holiday movie thing. It's a reminder that Christmas isn't just about presents and lights. It's also about keeping that spirit alive or else. <laughs> the ending's got this twist that'll have you questioning if it was all a bad dream or if Krampus really put the Engel family on his permanent naughty list. The mean one. This is like if someone took the classic Grinch story, threw it in a blender with some hardcore horror, and hit the puree button. We're in Newville, but bro, this town's got a shadow hanging over it and it's all kinds of messed up. Back in the day, this little girl, Cindy, you know, who 
has a run-in with the mean one, a nasty green monster. But when her mom tries to step up, things go sideways real fast. The mean one goes full beast mode and off Cindy's mom. Talk about a traumatic Christmas, homie. Now fast forward 20 years, Cindy's back in town thinking maybe she dreamt up the whole monster thing. The plot twist, her dad gets straight up whacked by the mean one. Now Cindy's like, now this monster's for real and is personal. Here's where it gets wild. Newville's in full on fear mode. They don't do Christmas cause it attracts the mean one. The mayor and the sheriff, they've been feeding this thing tourists dressed up like Santa. It's a crazy idea. Idea, but they're trying to keep the beast from chowing down on the locals. So like, I was, okay, I was kind of confused when I was first researching this one, but so the mean one is like attracted to Christmas. So that's why they don't celebrate Christmas because the mean one like sees Christmas and gets like attracted to it and then starts killing people, you know? Anyways, Cindy's done playing around. She's like, I'm gonna take this freak down. She turns into this one woman army setting up traps and whipping up some deadly Christmas themed weapons. We're talking about stuff that it makes Santa think twice, like explosive trees and candy cane shivs. The big showdown goes down at Cindy's place. It's an epic holly jolly bloodbath. But when Cindy's about to finish the mean one, she sees she's still got the necklace she gave him as a kid. It hits her that this monster, the mean one, he's kind of like her, all messed up because of that one bad night. In a twist no one saw coming, Cindy decides to forgive the mean one and get this. The mean one's heart grows so big from her kindness that it literally explodes. That's one way to stop a monster, I guess. After all the chaos, Newville becomes this internet sensation. Cindy, she's chilling now. PTSD is a thing of the past, and she's even got a thing going on with Deputy Burke. The movie wraps up hinting that maybe the mean one story isn't over, but for now, Newville's got his Christmas spirit back. Happy Death Day to you. Okay, also let me explain the first one really quick, because this iceberg just has the second one, but let me just give you some background on the first movie. So it's a slasher movie with a twist. We got Tree Gelbman, this college student who's living what seems to be a regular day, her birthday. But bro, this is not a happy birthday. It turns into her death day and things get straight up bizarre. Tree wakes up on her birthday, does her thing, but then bam, she gets murdered by this masked psycho. Crazy, right? But wait, it gets wilder. After she dies, she wakes up again on the same morning. It's like some freaky deja vu. It's her birthday again and she's stuck in this loop, reliving her death over and over. Talk about <laughs> bad birthday gift. I guess I won't complain next time my grandma gives me socks or whatever. <laughs> the whole movie, Tree's trying to figure out why she's stuck in this loop and who's trying to offer. It's like a murder mystery meets Groundhog Day. Each time she wakes up, she's got to piece together clues, trying to dodge death and find the killer. Tree's living this nightmare, dying in all sorts of ways. Some are kind of dark and some are kind of funny, <laughs> but with each loop, she's getting smarter, tougher, and piecing together the puzzle. The movie isn't just about the scares though, it's got heart. Tree starts off as this not so nice sorority girl, but these loops start to change her. She's learning, growing, become a better person with each reset, kind of like the good plays. It's like life's giving her a bunch of do-overs and she's making the most of them. As the movie rolls on, Tree's getting closer to uncovering the truth. She's facing her own issues, making amends, and turning her death day into a real journey of self-discovery. Okay, now for the sequel. Tree thought she was done with the whole dying everyday thing, but bruh, she's about to find out that the universe has got more wild cards up its sleeve. This time, it starts with her boy, Ryan, waking up in a loop of his own. But here's the twist. Ryan's working on this science project, a quantum reactor thing that's basically messing with time itself. The gang figures out that Ryan's experience is what's causing these loops. It's like Groundhog Day meets Back to the Future. They're trying to fix the mess, but then, bam, Tree gets thrown into another dimension. Again, talk about a bad case of deja vu. In this new dimension, stuff similar but also all kinds of different. Her mom's alive here, but her boyfriend Carter is dating someone else, and homie the killer is back on the loose. Tree's gotta navigate this whacked out version of her life while trying to stop the killer and fix the time loop. But here's where it gets real wild. Tree's gotta make a choice. Does she stay in this alternate reality where her mom is alive or go back to her own world? It's a tough call and Tree's all torn up about it. Meanwhile, the gang is racing against time trying to figure out the formula to close the loop. It's a bunch of trial and error and Tree's dying over and over again, sometimes in straight up hilarious ways. This movie's got a dope mix of like horror and comedy and some real feels. It's not just about the scares, it's about Tree figuring out what she really wants and what she's willing to sacrifice. It's wild, heartwarming, and it's got enough twists to keep you guessing. In the end, they finally do crack the code, but not before a bunch of crazy shenanigans go down. Tree decides where she truly belongs and gets her life back on track, for real this time. All right, that was layer one of this iceberg. This one doesn't have very many movies per layer, but there are a lot of layers, so don't worry. <laughs> Let's get into layer two, Leprechaun. So picture this, we're in North Dakota, which isn't exactly where you'd expect a Leprechaun story to go down, but here we are. There's this dude, Dan O'Grady, who snatches a Leprechaun's gold while in Ireland. Big 
mistake, bro. Because this leprechaun, played by the homie Warwick Davis, he isn't very friendly. Nah, he's a twisted little dude with a nasty temper and a serious love for gold. Dan thinks he's hit the jackpot and brings the gold back to the US, but the leprechaun follows him. Like, what the hell, right? Can't even enjoy your stolen gold in peace. <laughs> Dan manages to trap the leprechaun in a box with a four-leaf clover, because apparently that's like kryptonite to these guys. Fast forward 10 years, and we've got the Walshes moving into the O'Grady house. They're clueless about the pint-sized nightmare chilling in the basement. Jennifer Aniston's in this, by the way, playing Tori, way before her friend's days. She and this local dude Nathan, along with the little kid Alex and a mentally slow guy, Ozzy, accidentally free the leprechaun while fixing up the old house. Now, this leprechaun's all about getting his gold back, and he's not asking nicely. He's got some freaky powers, like teleportation, and he's got a mean streak. The leprechaun starts terrorizing the him, all the while dropping these wild rhymes and puns. Dude's got a crazy sense of humor in a creepy, weird way. <laughs> the gang discovers that the gold's the key to stopping him. Ozzy, the slow guy, swallows one of the gold coins, which turns into a real mess. The leprechaun's on a full-on rampage trying to get his coin back. It's a crazy chase with the leprechaun using all sorts of magic and mayhem to get at them. This movie's got its gory moments, but it's also kind of funny in a dark, twisted way. It's like a horror comedy where you're not sure if you should be scared or <laughs> laughing. In the end, they figure out the four-leaf clover trick to take down the leprechaun. Tony, Nathan, and the kiddo Alex. They manage to pin the leprechaun down and Alex shoots a clover straight into his mouth. Boom, the leprechaun melts away. For now, because this is just the first movie. <laughs> Black Christmas. Set in the sorority house during the Christmas break, the vibe is supposed to be all festive and chill, but nah, bruh, it turns into a straight-up nightmare. The sorority sisters start getting these creepy, obscene phone calls from some dude who's all sorts of messed up. He's breathing heavy, saying wild stuff, and the girls are like, what the hell is this? The main sorority sister, Jess, played by Olivia Hussey, she's the level-headed one. Then you got Barb, the wild card, played by Margot Kidder, who's throwing back drinks and tossing out sassy comebacks. The house mother, Mrs. Mack, she's kind of clueless but hilarious, always sneaking booze from hidden spots around the house. But the mood shifts real quick when one of their own, Claire, goes missing. Her dad shows up looking for her and the sisters are clueless. They think maybe she took off with her boyfriend, but the audience knows better. We've seen Claire. She's the first victim of the mysterious caller who's actually in the house. Yeah, homie, the calls are coming from inside the house classic horror move. The police get involved, led by this dude, Lieutenant Fuller. They aren't taking things seriously at first, but as more weird stuff goes down, like another girl missing and obscene phone calls escalating, they start to catch on that something's real wrong. Meanwhile, Jess is dealing with her own drama. She's pregnant and wants an abortion, but her intense boyfriend Peter in but her intense boyfriend Peter isn't down with that. He's all emotional and unstable, which makes you wonder if he's the killer. The tension's cranked up as the body count rises. The killer's POV shots are crazy creepy. Like you're seeing through the eyes of a madman. The sorority house, once all cozy, now feels like a trap. The climax is wild. Jess gets isolated in the house and it's this intense cat and mouse game. The police finally trace the calls and tell Jess the killer's in the house, but it's a heart-pounding moment. In a twisted turn, Jess thinks Peter's the killer. He shows up at the house acting all bizarre and in a panic, Jess kills him. But here's the kicker, Peter wasn't the killer. The real killer's still in the house and the movie ends with this chilling ambiguity. The phone starts ringing again and the credits roll, leaving you like, yo, what just happened? All right, that was layer two. Let's get into layer three. Christmas, bloody Christmas. So the scene's set in the small town on Christmas Eve, an awesome record store owner who's more about rock and roll than carols. She's planning to spend her night kicking it with her friends, including Robbie, her chill employee. They're all set for a night of booze, tunes, and good times. But bruh, here's where it gets wild. The town's got this massive robotic Santa as part of their Christmas decor. Sounds cool, right? But this Santa goes from ho 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 to oh no no. <laughs> Due to some tech glitches, this robot Santa flips and becomes a killing machine. It's like a holiday decoration just took a dark turn. The night quickly spirals into chaos. This robo Santa starts tearing through the town and it isn't with festive cheer. It's slashing and crashing, turning the silent night into a scream-filled fright fest. Tori and Robbie, they find themselves in the middle of this holiday horror, fighting for their lives against a Santa gone psycho. As the night unfolds, the town is painted red, but not with Christmas lights. It's blood only. Tori steps up big time, transforming from a cool shop owner to a total survivalist. She ain't about to let some rogue robot ruin her Christmas Eve. The movie's got this dope mix of slasher vibes and dark comedy. It's like watching a holiday special that's been hijacked by a horror show. The action's intense, with Tori and Robbie dodging deadly blows from this twisted Santa bot. Throughout the night, 
is the hardcore game of cat and mouse. They're using everything they've got, from holiday decorations turned weapons to straight up street smarts, to take down this mechanized menace. The final showdown is epic. Tori goes head to head with Robot Santa in a battle that's anything but merry. Wait, isn't this the same vibe and plot as that one Futurama Christmas bit? My Bloody Valentine. Wait, is this a My Bloody Valentine reference? You know, like the band or whatever. <laughs> this 1981 flick is set in a small, kind of sleepy mining town called Valentine Bluffs. But bro, this place has got a dark past. Back in the day, there was a mining disaster on Valentine's Day because some supervisors wanted to dip out early for a dance. One dude, Harry Warden, gets trapped but survives. Dude's not happy about it though. A year later, he comes back and starts taking out the supervisors, leaving a warning. No more Valentine's Day dances. Fast forward 20 years and the town is like, yo, let's bring back the Valentine's dance. They think Harry's long gone, but they're about to find out that they're dead wrong. Pun intended. The young miners and their girls- <laughs> Dude, saying that out loud is <laughs> cursed. The young miners and their girls are all pumped for the dance, thinking it's gonna be a chill night. But things go from 0 to 100 real quick when these heart-shaped boxes start showing up with actual human hearts inside. Like, what the hell, right? The police chief and mayor are freaking out, thinking Harry's back for round two. The night at the dance, the horror kicks in. There's this killer in mining gear, and homie, oh he's not there to dance. He starts offing people left and right, turning the dance into a bloodbath. The town is in a panic, and everyone suspecting is Harry Warden back for revenge. Our main crew, the miners and their girls, friends, they're caught up in this mess. They're trying to figure out who the killer is while dodging getting axed themselves. It's like a love story gone real bad. As the bodies pile up, the suspense is through the roof. Everyone's a suspect and the twists keep coming. The movie's got this gritty, raw vibe. It's a slasher, but with a dose of realism that makes it even scarier. In the end, the killer's identity is a total shocker. It's not Harry, but someone you wouldn't expect. The final showdown is intense, with a twist that leaves you thinking, damn, that's messed up. Jack Frost. This is not your chill, happy snowman movie. Nah bro, this is some straight up horror comedy madness. Picture this, Jack Frost, a serial killer cold as ice, is on his way to get executed. But fate has got a twist of sense of humor. There's a wild accident with a genetics truck, and homie Jack gets turned into a killer snowman. Yeah, you heard that right, an actual killer snowman. We're chilling in Snowminton, the small town where folks are all about Christmas. Little do they know, Jack Frost, now all snowy and murderous, is about to turn their winter wonderland into a nightmare. The town sheriff, Sam, he's our main dude. He's got a pass with Jack and starts starts piecing things together when bodies start showing up frosty style. Sam's like, yo, we got a killer snowman on the loose, but who's gonna believe that? Jack, the snowman from hell, starts going on a rampage, offing people in the most bizarre ways. It's wild because he's got these snowman powers now, like turning into water and refreezing. The kills are over the top and Jack's got jokes too, spitting out one-liners as he ices folks. The whole town, including Sam and his squad, gotta figure out how to take down Jack before he turns the whole place into a frozen horror show. It's all kinds of crazy with wild chases and close shaves, and let's just say, carrots aren't just for noses. If <laughs> you catch my drift. As the movie rolls to its climax, things get even more bonkers. Sam and the gang come up with this nutty plan to melt Jack and save the day. It's a full-on battle against this frosty fiend, and let's just say, it's not your typical Christmas showdown. Jack Frost is like a holiday horror trip with a side of laughs. It's so out there you can't help but vibe with it. It's got chills, thrills, and a snowman that'll make you think twice about building one in your front yard. Wild stuff, for real. April Fool's Day. This movie is like someone took the whole concept of an April Fool's prank and said, yo, let's make a horror movie out of this. So the scene is set at this fancy mansion on a secluded island, right? Our main girl, Muffy St. John, she's hosting a weekend getaway for her college friends. Think typical 80s college crew. You get the jokester, the jock, the nice guy, the shy girl, and a few more. They're all psyched for a chill weekend, but bro, they have no idea what they're in for. As soon as they get to the island, weird stuff starts happening. We're talking creepy pranks that are a little too twisted for a laugh. But hey, it's April Fool's Day, so everyone's like, ha ha ha, very funny, Muffy. But things take a dark turn when members of the group start disappearing. Like, one minute they're there, next they're gone. And the crew's like, what the hell is going on? The movie plays out like your classic slasher. There's tension, suspicion, and a whole lot of guessing who's behind all this. It's got that eerie vibe where you don't know who to trust. Is it Muffy playing a sick joke, or is there something more sinister at play? 
As the weekend unfolds, the friends are trying to figure out what's real and what's just an April Fool's prank. But the stakes get real high when they start finding their friends' bodies. Yeah, homie, it turns into a full-blown horror show. The plot twists and turns, keeping you guessing who the killer could be. It's got suspense, a bit of humor, and some seriously creepy moments. The friends are all on edge, trying to survive the weekend and get off the island. But here's where it gets wild. The movie's ending is a total mind-bender. Turns out the whole thing was an elaborate April Fool's prank by Muffy who's testing out an idea for a horror-themed hotel. Yeah, all the friends are alive and it was all just staged. Talk about a commitment to a prank. Valentine. This movie kicks off with this flashback to a middle school dance in the 80s. We get this kid, Jeremy Melton, trying to get some love on the dance floor, but he's getting straight up projected and bullied. Talk about a rough Valentine's Day, bruh. Fast forward to the present and we're with this group of friends, all grown up and living their lives. But here's the catch. They're the same girls who rejected Jeremy back in the day. Now they're dealing with their own adult drama like bad relationships and work stress. But homie, they're about to have bigger problems. As Valentine's Day rolls around, the girls start getting these creepy cards and gifts. They're thinking, who's the weirdo sending these? But they ain't too worried. That is, until people around them start getting offed in some brutal ways, right around Valentine's Day. The killer? This dude's wearing a cherub mask and is all about making this Valentine's Day one to remember, but for all the wrong reasons. He's taking out anyone connected to these girls and the deaths are all kind of gory and creative. It's like cute had gone psycho. The main girls, they're freaking out, trying to figure out who's behind the mask. Is it Jeremy back for revenge? Or is it someone else with a grudge? The suspense is high and everyone's a suspect. As they dig deeper, secrets start coming out. Turns out their past isn't as pretty as they thought. They've got to deal with the consequences of how they treated Jeremy, all while trying to not be the next name on the killer's list. The movie's got this mix of 90s slasher vibes and early 2000s style. It's like a Valentine's Day card soaked in blood. The tension builds up to this climactic party where the killer's identity is finally revealed in a wild twist. Uncle Sam. This is the horror flick that takes the whole patriotic Uncle Sam thing and flips it into a freaky slasher movie. Imagine 4th of July, but with a killer twist. The movie kicks off with Sam Harper, a soldier who gets killed in friendly fire during the Gulf War. But, but bro, his story isn't over. His body shipped back to his hometown for a hero's burial. But here's where it gets wild. Sam is not resting in peace. Back in his hometown, we've got young Jody, Sam's nephew who idolizes him. Jody's all about that military life because of his uncle, but homie, he's about to get a reality check. See, Sam comes back from the dead all zombie style and he's on a mission, but it ain't a mission of honor, it's a mission of revenge. Dude is bitter about how he died and decides to take it out on the town. He dresses up in his old Uncle Sam outfit and it's straight up creepy. The town's gearing up for the 4th of July celebrations, thinking it's just gonna be fireworks and flags, but they got another thing coming, who he thinks are unpatriotic. It's like a bloody, twisted version of a patriotism test. The kills are all kinds of gory and over the top, we're talking classic 90s horror style with a side of dark humor. Sam's targeting anyone from corrupt politicians to tax evaders. If you aren't living up to his twisted standards of patriotism, you're on his list. Meanwhile, Jody is starting to see his uncle is not the hero he thought. As the body count rises, he's piecing together who's behind the Uncle Sam mask. It's a wild realization and Jody's got to confront the fact that his idol is now a nightmare. The climax hits at the town's big 4th of July celebration. Zombie Sam's wreaking havoc and Jody, along with his friends and some local authority who's got to take him down. It's like a showdown between the living and the dead with some serious fireworks. New Year's Evil. This movie is like a New Year's Eve countdown, but with a horror twist that's all kinds of crazy. We're kicking off with this punk rock TV hostess, Diane Blaze Sullivan. She's hosting this dope live New Year's Eve TV show called Hollywood Hotline, and it's all about that rock and roll life. But bruh, the night takes a dark turn when Blaze gets this creepy phone call during the show. This mysterious dude calling himself evil is like, yo, I'm gonna off someone at midnight in each time zone. Like, what the hell, right? Blaze and her crew think it's some wacko pulling a prank, but dude, they're dead wrong. As the night rolls on, this evil dude starts making good on his promise. He's offing people left and right, and it's all kinds of gory. The dude's got a thing for timing his kills with a stroke of midnight. Talk about a twisted way to ring in the new year. Meanwhile, Blaze is freaking out because her son, Derek, is acting all weird and clingy. Plus, she's trying to keep it together for the live show. There's a whole lot of drama and suspense. The police get involved, but catching this killer is not easy, especially when he keeps hopping time zones. The movie's got this mix of 80s slasher vibes with a bit of a thriller element. It's like your 
are counting down not just to the new year but to the next kill. Evil keeps calling Blaze throughout the night, taunting her and the cops, making it a deadly game of cat and mouse. As the final countdown to midnight approaches, things get even more intense. Blaze has got to face off against this psycho killer, and the reveal of who Evil really is? Bro, it is a twist that you do not see coming. Alright, layer 3 is over, let's get into layer 4. Curtains. This is a slasher flick that's all about the dark side of showbiz mixed with some real creepy vibes. The story kicks off with this actress, Samantha Sherwood, working with director Jonathan Stryker on a film called Audra. Samantha, she's all in for this role, even getting herself committed to a mental hospital to understand her character better. Talk about dedication, bro. But plot twist, Stryker ditches her and holds auditions for a new Audra at this eerie secluded mansion. He's got six actresses coming out to try, but told me these auditions are more twisted than your average Hollywood callback. Strikers playing mind games, pitting these hopefuls against each other in a twisted competition. Also guys, uh, starting in layer 4, I just woke up recording this and I feel like my voice sounds a little like weird and different, so uh, that's, that's my bad if it does. I got my coffee though. Then things go from sketchy to straight up scary. A killer rocking this freaky old hag mask starts picking off the actresses. It's a real life horror show with each one getting off in this classic gory slasher style. We're talking about ice skates and sickles, this killer is not playing around. Meanwhile, Samantha breaks out of the hospital and heads to the mansion cause she's not about to let Stryker play her like that. Now everyone's suspecting each other, wondering who the psycho in the hag mask is. Is it Samantha, out for revenge? One of the actresses desperate for the role? Or someone else lurking in the shadows? Shadows, is that an elven reference? <laughs> the flick's got this eerie, suspenseful feel, mixing up psychological thriller stuff with hardcore horror. It's like the line between the acting world and real terror got all blurred. Curtains plays with the idea of how far some people will go for fame, and in this case, it's deadly. As the killer keeps slashing through the competition, the tension is through the roof. Who's gonna make it out of this deadly audition alive? And when the killer is unmasked, bro, the twist hits you like a ton of bricks. Like leather gloves on the hardcore. You got these in silver? The Prowler. This is this old school slasher flick that starts off post World War II, 1945. We got this soldier who gets totally played. His girl Rosemary drops him a Dear John letter. She's like, peace out, shotty. I'm out. Dude is heartbroken and you can bet he's not taking it well. Flash forward to 1980, we're in this small town getting ready for their first spring dance since 1945. Why no dances since then, you ask? Because back in 45, right after that letter gets dropped, Rosemary and her new man get straight up murdered by a dude in army fatigues. The town has been spooked ever since. The students at Avalon Bay are all hyped for the dance, thinking the past is the past. But bro, they are dead wrong. Turns out, the killer from 45 is back, and homie is still rocking the World War II gear. Talk about holding a grudge, bro, it's been like 40 years. As the dance gets going, the Prowler, as they call him, starts doing what slashers do best, taking out teens in some pretty gnarly ways. It's all pitchforks, bayonets, and blood. This guy is like the grim reaper of dances. We got this final girl, Pam, and her boyfriend, Mark, who's also a deputy. They're starting to piece things together, like, yo, why are our friends getting murked on dance night? It's a whole mystery wrapped in this blood. Bloodbath. The kills in this movie are straight up brutal. The Prowler is not messing around. He's like a shadow lurking, waiting, and then bam, another one bites the dust. And the way they show it, man, it's all like up close and personal. Pam and Mark are on this mission to stop the Prowler, but it's not easy. Every time they think they're close, the dude slips away, leaving only bodies behind. The suspense is mad real with that 80s horror movie feel where you're yelling at the screen because you know what's coming next. The climax is wild, shoddy. Pam and Mark finally face off against the Prowler in this showdown that's got more twists than a pretzel. When they reveal who's under that army gear, it's like, no way, did not see that coming. Oh my God, guys, my cat is like curled like a, like a pretzel in my lap right now and it's so cute. <laughs> it's like 8 a.m. bro and she's just, she's just vibe with me here. Oh, the window has like sun like on my lap. So she's like all like warm and stuff. Oh my God, so cute. Night of the Lepus. This is not your typical horror flick. It's like someone looked at cute fluffy bunnies and thought, yeah, what if they were giant and <laughs> terrifying? wild concept, right? So here's the scoop. We're out in the American Southwest, and there's trouble brewing with these wild farmers. They're chomping down crops, causing all sorts of headaches for the local farmers. Enter our main folks, Roy and Gary Bennett, a couple of scientists trying to figure out how to control the rabbit population. They're like, let's be smart about this, but homie, they have no idea what they're about to unleash. They start experimenting with these hormonal injections, thinking they can mess with the rabbit's breeding. But shoddy, one of the test rabbits gets loose and hops right back into the wild. And here's where things get straight up Bizarre. These rabbits start growing massive. We're talking bunnyzilla sized. Now the movie turns into a pure, unadulterated, campy horror. These giant rabbits, they're not just hopping around and being cute. No, they're on a rampage, attacking locals and causing chaos. 
It's like a fluffy nightmare come to life, and the scenes are so wild they can swing back right into being hilarious. Meanwhile, the Bennets, along with this cowboy dude Cole and the local law, Sheriff Cody, they're scrambling to stop these monstrous hares. It's a full-on battle between bunny behemoths and the townsfolk are like, what the hell is going on? Imagine looking outside and you just see like a Godzilla-sized bunny, bro. <laughs> Wait, I think I remember there being a meme of a big bunny or something somewhere. Insert Big Chunga song. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this movie's got a mix of horror and sci-fi with a side of 70s cheese. The special effects, let's just say they're a product of their time. Think massive bunnies hopping in slow-mo, wreaking havoc. It's so absurd, you can't help but be entertained. As the night rolls on, the showdown with the rabbits gets more intense. They're using everything from guns to electrified train tracks to try and stop the hoppy horde. The climax is this blend of horror and hilarity that you've got to see to believe. Night of the Lepus is a classic in the so bad is good category. It's a film that takes a leap with this premise and ends up being this oddly charming mix of horror and absurdity. It's a reminder that in the world of horror movies, anything can be terrifying. Even a bunch of oversized bunnies. Crazy stuff stuff for real. Next time you see a rabbit hopping around, just be glad it ain't as big as a car, like in Night of the Lepus. <laughs> Red Clover. This flick is like St. Patrick's Day turned into a horror scene. Imagine leprechauns, but forget about the lucky charms. These dudes are straight up savage. We're chilling in this small town all prepped for St. Patty's Day, but bro, this town's got a dark past with a leprechaun curse. The legend goes way back like some old school grudge that hasn't been settled yet. Enter our main girl, Karen O'Hara. She's cool, smart, and she's about to get wrapped up in this ancient curse. Her granddad, Pop O'Hara, accidentally unleashed his leprechaun years ago, and homie has been bad news ever since. Now, Karen's out in the woods one day, and she accidentally sets the leprechaun free again. Talk about bad luck, shoddy. This ain't no friendly green hat wearing dude. Nah, this leprechaun's all about chaos and blood. It starts terrorizing the town, turning the St. Paddy celebrations into a fight for survival. The leprechaun's on a rampage, and it's up to Karen and her fam to stop Stop it. They dive deep into their family history, trying to figure out how to break the curse. It's like a puzzle wrapped in a horror story. A puzzle wrapped in a horror story? Is that a Puzzle Agent Grickle reference? Meanwhile, the town is getting wrecked. This leprechaun is not playing around. It's like a creature feature mixed with a holiday gone wrong. The townspeople, they're caught off guard thinking leprechauns are just cute fairy tales, but they're about to learn the hard way that some myths are better left alone. As Karen gets closer to the truth... <laughs> I'm sorry, whenever I said that, I just imagined like a Karen in a McDonald's like trying to like investigate the truth behind like why they got her order wrong or something, bro. <laughs> that's, so, that's so like middle school. Oh my God, I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> Anyways, as Karen gets closer to the truth, things get wilder. She's got to face this monster head on, and it's a showdown that's all sorts of intense. We're talking ancient rituals, family secrets, and a battle against a creature straight out of Irish folklore. Speaking of folklore, be on the lookout for a folk horror iceberg coming soon, because I love folk horror, so I'm doing a folk horror iceberg soon, so look out for that. Red Clover mixes up the horror genre with a bit of that Irish myth vibe. It ain't just your typical slasher or monster movie, it's got a backstory that's as twisted as it is intriguing. It's a reminder that sometimes the scariest things come from the most unexpected places like a leprechaun on St. Patty's Day. <laughs> Wild stuff for real. Next time you're out celebrating, just be glad there's no cursed leprechauns crashing your party. Easter Bunny Massacre, The Bloody Trail. This flick's like an Easter gone full horror mode, bro. It's not about hunting for eggs. It's about surviving a psycho in a bunny suit. Wait, is that a cemetery reference? So picture this. We're in this chill little town getting all hyped for Easter. They're setting up egg hunts and all that cute stuff, but little do they know, they got a nightmare hopping their way. The movie starts off with this group of friends planning to throw this dope Easter party. They're thinking it's gonna be all laughs, booze, and good times, but shoddy, they got another thing coming. See, there's this legend in the town about a dude dressed as an Easter bunny who went on a rampage years ago. But everyone's like, nah, that's just an old tale to spook kids, that's not real. But here's where it gets real. Turns out the Easter bunny killer isn't just a legend. Dude's back and he's got a thirst for blood, not chocolate. The friends start finding finding these creepy blood-stained eggs and it's like a sick game. They're freaking out thinking it's a prank, but homie is about to get deadly. One by one, the killer bunny starts taking out folks in the town. It's brutal with some gnarly kills that'll have you thinking twice about cuddly bunnies. This bunny's got more than just a basket of eggs. He's got a basket of terror. 
The main crew, they're trying to figure out who's behind the mask. Is it someone they know? A stranger? The suspense is mad thick with everyone suspecting each other. It's like a twisted whodunit mixed with a slasher. As the night rolls on, the party turns into a fight for survival. They're trapped with a maniac in a bunny suit and it's a wild chase to stay alive. The movie's got this mix of dark humor and horror like you're not sure if you should be scared or laughing at the absurdity. The climax hits this epic showdown where the friends finally unmask the bunny. The reveal, bro, is someone they never suspected. The whole thing's a twist that'll leave you like, no way, did not see that coming. Ugh. Happy birthday to me. This is a slasher that's got like a twisted birthday surprise. Think of it like blowing out candles, but instead of wishes, you get screams. So here's the deal. We're at this elite high school with a clique called the Top 10. They're the cool kids, the ones everybody knows. Our main girl, Virginia, she's part of this squad. But bro, she's got a dark past. Like she survived a deadly car accident and her mom didn't make it. Heavy stuff, right? Now Virginia's birthday is coming up and she's trying to move past her trauma, but hold up, things start getting all kinds of weird. Members of the top 10 start disappearing and it's got everyone tripping. Like one minute they're chilling, next minute poof, gone. And homies, not because they're skipping town. The twist? The killer's offing them in these wild elaborate ways. We're talking shish kebab style murders. Jim Waits crushing skulls. This isn't your average birthday party game. It's like a horror show with a side of cake. Virginia's freaking out because her friends are dropping like flies. And the crazy part, she's having these blackouts, waking up with no clue what she did. It's got her wondering if she's the one doing the killings. Like, is it her or is there someone else rocking this twisted birthday bash? As the body count rises, the plot thickens. Virginia's digging into her past and covering some messed up family secrets. It's all leading to her big birthday party and shoddy, this is not going to be a happy celebration. The climax hits of Virginia's birthday bash and it's all sorts of intense. Secrets spill, the killer is revealed, and it's a twist that'll have you like, what the hell? The final reveal is mad shocking. It ties back to Virginia's past and flips the whole story on its head. Happy Birthday to Me is a classic in the slasher genre. It's got the chills, the thrills, and a birthday that's about surviving more than celebrating. It's a reminder that sometimes the scariest things happen when the candles go out. Wild stuff for real. Next time you make a birthday wish, just be glad it's not in this movie's universe. <laughs> All right, Lair 4 is over. Let's get into Lair 5, guys. Nutcracker Massacre. This movie's like a twisted holiday tale that turns the classic Nutcracker into something straight up nightmarish. We start with Clara, this novelist who's dealing with some heartbreak because her man, Paul, played her. She's like, I need a break from this drama and heads to her auntie Marie's, like country manor, to chill for the holidays. But bruh, she's about to step into a whole different kind of drama. On her way, Clara stops by this antiques shop where this quirky dealer is like, shoddy, you timeless, and sells her this Nutcracker doll. Little does she know, she's bringing home more than just a decoration. Now at Auntie Marie's place, there's already this massive six foot Nutcracker chilling behind the Christmas tree. It's all festive and stuff, but then when the clock strikes midnight on Christmas Eve, things get real. The Nutcracker's eyes light up and it's not with holiday spirit, it's more like, I'm I'm about to wreck this silent night. The first to get a taste of the Nutcracker's wrath? This poor delivery dude who shows up at the wrong time. From there, it's like the Nutcracker's got a hit list and he's not checking it twice. Claire is thrown into this wild situation. She came home for a quiet holiday, but instead she's facing off against this possessed Nutcracker. It's slashing through the manor, turning her holiday retreat into a fight for survival. The movie's got this creepy vibe, mixing classic holiday elements with horror. It's like every time you think it's about to get cozy, the Nutcracker pops up like, nah, shoddy. Think again. Puka. This movie is part of the Into the Dark series, and bro, it takes you on a wild ride. So the story is about this actor, Wilson. He's looking for his big break and lands this gig as Puka, a character in a new Christmas toy campaign. Puka is this weird, kind of cute, but also kind of creepy toy that's about to be the season's hottest thing. Wilson is like, I this could be cool, but shoddy, he has no idea what he signed up for. Wilson starts wearing this massive Puka suit for promotional gigs, but things get weird real quick. When he's in the suit, Wilson starts losing grip on what What's real and what's not. It's like Puka's got a mind of his own and Wilson is caught up in his world. The suit's got two modes, naughty and nice. When it's nice, Puka's all cute and cuddly, but when it flips to naughty, things get dark and twisted. And the freaky part, Wilson starts feeling these changes even when he's not wearing the suit. It's like he's living in a trippy, messed up Puka reality. The movie flips between Wilson's life and these bizarre, surreal episodes where he's Puka. It's hard to tell what's happening for real and what's just in Wilson's head. The lines get all blurred and it's like a psychological maze. As Wilson gets deeper into being Puka, his life starts spiraling. He's got this love interest, Melanie, but even that gets all tangled 
explode in the puka craziness. It's like a love story wrapped in a psychological horror package. Puka throws you curveballs left and right. It's got jump scares, eerie vibes, and a vibe that's hard to shake. Wilson's journey as Puka makes you question reality, and the ending is a total mind trip. It flakes a mix of horror, psychological thriller, and a dark holiday tale. It's not your usual Christmas movie. It's a deep dive into a character's psyche with a holiday twist. Puka is a reminder that sometimes the scariest things come in the most innocent packages. Wild stuff, for real. Next time you see a holiday toy, you might just wonder if there's more to it than meets the eye. A Christmas horror story. This movie is set in this town called Bailey Downs, where some real creepy stuff's been going down. It's Christmas Eve and everyone's gearing up for the holidays, but homie, they're about to get more than they bargained for. The movie's got these four interwoven stories, each one freakier than the last. It's like an anthology. First up, we've got this group of teens investigating a spooky incident at their school from the year before. They're all like, let's be detectives, but shiny they have no idea what they're walking into. It's like a ghost story meets high school drama and things get real twisted real fast. Then there's this family heading to their grandma's house. Sounds chill, right? But nah, their son gets all weird after wandering off into the woods. He starts acting all kinds of strange and the family is like, what the hell happened to those trees? Story number three is about this cop who had a freaky encounter in the same woods last year. He's back on duty, but bruh, the past is not done with him. It's like a creepy haunted walk down memory lane. And the final story is about Santa himself, but this is not any jolly old Saint Nick. He's battling zombie elves at the North Pole. Yeah, you heard that right. Zombie elves. It's like a Christmas nightmare with Santa going full warrior mode. The movie keeps hopping between these stories, tying them all together in this wild, horror-filled bow. There's suspense, scares, and a whole lot of what's gonna happen next vibes. As the night rolls in, each story is darker and crazier. We're talking about ghostly encounters, demonic transformations, and a Santa that's more about slaying than slaying. You know what I mean? Like slaying isn't like slay like kill, and slaying isn't like a like the slay, you know? You know, you, you get it. Well, see, the joke is actually that it's like slaying and slaying are the same word, but they're spelled differently and they have different meanings, but they're but you but they sound the same. So I'm saying like slaying that I mean that's 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 and the climax is all kinds of insane. The twists and turns hit you like a sled on an icy hill. It ties all the stories together in a way that's like, yo, I didn't see that coming. Secret Santa. So April Pope played by So April Pope played by A. Leslie Kyes, she's dreading this family gathering at her mom's house. Her man Ty is coming along, but neither of them know what they're walking into. It's like walking into a battlefield, but instead of guns, there's eggnog and presents. The Pope family, bruh, they're all kinds of dysfunctional. April's mom, Shari, she's the queen of mean, played by Deborah Sullivan. Shari's got a talent for tearing her kids down with her, quote, darts, these cutting remarks that could slice through steel. She's like the Godzilla of bad parenting, and everyone's in her path of destruction. Ty, he's a newbie here, and he's quick to see that the horror stories about Shari are legit. She's got this way of making everyone around her feel miserable from body shaming to finishing her son's sentences because she can't stand his stutter. Shari's on a roll. The fam's got all these stereotypes cranked up to 11. You got the bitter egg showing up uninvited, the sibling who's like a walking storm cloud of resentment, and even some sketchy romances that are a little too close to home. It's a messed up mix of homophobia, racism, and classism. Like every bad family gathering, but worse. The movie's got this dark, twisted vibe, but when the Secret Santa game starts, things go from tense to straight up terrifying. Everyone gets these gifts that bring out the worst in them. It's like a switch flips, and the family goes from passive aggressive to just aggressive. The house turns into a war zone. We're talking about full blown brawls, nasty truth spilling out, and everyone's worst side showing. It's a holiday horror where the biggest threat isn't a monster or a ghost, but your own flesh and blood. April and Ty, they're caught in the middle of this madness, trying to dodge both physical and emotional blows. The film shows how the worst of family tensions can explode into violence, turning a of gathering into a fight for survival. Secret Santa is not pulling any punches. It's a brutal, is that an Olivia Rodrigo reference? Look at family dynamics during the holidays with a heavy dose of horror. The performances are killer with each actor diving into their twisted roles. It's a wild ride, this equal parts horrifying and fascinating. This movie's like tearing open a present to find a grenade. Unexpected, explosive, and unforgettable. And Christmassy. <laughs> Secret Santa will make you grateful for even the most awkward family Christmas because at least it's not as messy 
dressed up as the popes. Wild stuff, for real. This holiday horror is not about spreading cheer, it's about <laughs> surviving your relatives. Blood Rage. This movie starts off back in the 70s at this drive-in. We got these twin bros, Todd and Terry. They're just chilling, but Terry, he's got some serious issues. Dude commits a wild murder right there and then at the drive-in. And then, cold as ice, frames his twin, Todd, for the whole thing. Talk about a pretty messed up move. Flash forward to the 80s, Todd has been locked up in a mental hospital because everyone thinks he's the slasher. But on Thanksgiving, Todd busts out. He's like, I'm done being the scapegoat. But shoddy, this sets off a chain reaction. Terry, who's been living his best life, hears about Todd's escape and loses it. It's like a switch flips in his head and he goes back to his murderous ways. And homie, he does not hold back. The setting is this apartment complex where their mom, Maddie, is living. She's all about Thanksgiving dinner, totally oblivious to the fact that Terry's about to turn it into a horror show. Terry goes on a rampage, offing the neighbors in some seriously gnarly ways. It's that classic 80s slasher style, over the top and full of gore. Meanwhile, Todd is on a mission to clear his name. He's been creeping around trying to piece together how to prove he's not the killer. But with Terry going ham, it's a tough sell. The complex, turn the complex turns into a battleground. Everyone is suspecting everyone, and the tension's crazy high. Maddie's caught in the middle, torn between her two sons. She can't fathom that Terry, her golden boy, could be the real psycho. Dude, is that two Blade references in a row? Her golden boy could be the real psycho? Drain gang. This movie's this movie's got this wild mix of family drama, suspense, and full-blown slasher madness. The kills are brutal, the drama is intense, and the whole twin twist adds another layer of what the hell. And when it all comes to a head, it's a Thanksgiving face-off that's all kinds of intense. Todd versus Terry, good twin versus evil twin, and a showdown that's as messy as it gets. Blood Rage isn't just a slasher flick, it's a deep dive into a twisted family saga with a side of holiday horror. It's a reminder that the real terror can sometimes be hiding right under your nose, maybe even at the Thanksgiving table. Wild stuff for real. After watching Blood Rage, your family's Thanksgiving drama might seem like a walk in the park. This movie takes past the stuffing and turns it into past the survival guide. <laughs> Do you get it? <laughs> Alright guys, that was layer 5. Let's get into layer 6. Oh my gosh. Hey, knock knock guys. Who's there? Ohio. Ohio who? Ohio level 5 guy at Skippity Toilet. <laughs> No, on a real note though, guys, um, Jesus loves you. Jesus does love you, and it's never too late to turn from your sin and your depression and fall into Jesus' great love that he offers to anybody. Because that's what it is, love. It's not just rules, it's love. That's what he offers. Anyways, let's get into, um, let's get into Bunny Man Massacre. <laughs> Bunny Man Massacre. Shoddy, this is not any cute Easter story. It's more like if the Easter bunny went off the rails and turned into a psycho killer. Wild, right? So here's what goes down. The movie's all about this dude in a bunny suit, but not Nah, he's not handing out chocolate eggs. He's out there in the middle of nowhere, wreaking havoc and slashing anyone who crosses his path. It's like some twisted version of a childhood nightmare. The story kicks off with a group of friends on a road trip. They're just cruising, looking for a good time, but homie, they take a wrong turn straight into Terrorville. They cross paths with this bunny man, and let's just say he's not in the mood for making friends. This bunny man, he's big, he's creepy, and he's got this massive chainsaw that he's not afraid to use. The friends quickly realize they're in deep trouble. It's like they stumbled into a horror movie and they're the stars. Because wait, they actually did because this is a horror movie. <laughs> why, why did I write that? Why did I, why did I write that? <laughs> Anyways, as they try to escape, things get wild. The bunny man is on their tail and he's relentless. We're talking about some intense chase scenes, close calls, and a whole lot of screaming. It's like a game of cat and mouse, but with a psycho bunny and a chainsaw. The movie's got this gritty, raw vibe. It's not just about the kills, it's about the suspense and the fear. It plays with your head, making you wonder what you would do if you were stuck in the middle of nowhere with a bunny man after you. The friends are doing everything they can to survive, but this bunny man's got some tricks up his sleeve. It's a bloody battle for survival, and not everyone is making it out alive. As the plot unfolds, we get glimpses into the bunny man's twisted world. It's all kinds of messed up and you can't help but be freaked out by this guy. He's like the stuff of legends but way more terrifying. The climax? Bro, is intense. It's a showdown between the friends and the bunny man, and it's as crazy as you'd expect. Chainsaws, screams, and a fight to the death. It's all there. Christmas Evil, also known as You Better Watch Out, is a unique twist on holiday horror. The film centers on Harry, a toy factory worker with a deep obsession with Christmas. But homie, Harry is not your jolly Santa. He's got a dark side. Growing up traumatized by witnessing Santa, his dad, being naughty, Harry's adult life is like a mix of childlike fascination with Christmas and 
a disturbed sense of justice. He spies on neighborhood kids, judging who's naughty or nice. The movie takes a turn when Harry snaps, donning a Santa suit and taking his judgment to extreme levels. He starts punishing the naughty, doling out his own twisted version of holiday cheer. The film's got a psychological angle, exploring Harry's broken psyche and his warped desire to embody the Christmas spirit. It's as much a character study as it is a horror movie. The climax is a wild ride, with Harry fully embracing his Santa persona, leading to a bizarre and memorable ending. Thanksgiving. The movie starts with this totally out there scene from way back in the day, like the first Thanksgiving. But bro, it's not about pilgrims and peace, it's about a killer turkey. Yeah, you heard that right. A turkey that's out for blood. This is not any ordinary bird, it's a foul-mouthed homicidal turkey with a grudge. Fast forward to modern times and we got this group of college kids heading home for Thanksgiving break. They're your typical horror movie crew, the jock, the good girl, the party dude, and the ditzy one. They're thinking it's gonna be chill times and turkey dinners, but homie, they're in for a surprise. Their car breaks down, classic horror style, in the middle of nowhere, and who should show up but our psycho turkey named Turkey. Yeah, with an IE at the end. This bird's got a mouth on him and a thirst for revenge. He's like, I've been waiting centuries for this, and now it's time to base some humans. The turkey starts offing the students in some seriously messed up ways. We're talking about a turkey that's brutal, clever, and has one-liners for days. It's so ridiculous, it's kind of hilarious. Like, who knew a puppet turkey could be this savage? The movie's got this vibe, this half-horror, half-comedy. It knows it's over the top and leans into it hard. The kills are gory, the dialogue is really cheesy, and the whole thing is a wild ride. As Turkey goes on his rampage, the students are trying to figure out how to stop him. It's the battle of wits. Well, as much as you can have with a killer turkey. There's some crazy lore about how to kill Turkey, and it's like a twisted Thanksgiving quest. Thanksgiving is a low-budget flick that's all about the laughs and the shocks. It's not really about taking itself seriously, and that's the best part. It's a reminder that sometimes horror movies can just be about having fun and pushing boundaries. So if you're looking for a movie that's part slasher, part comedy, and all kinds of absurd, Thanksgiving is your jam. Just be ready for Turkey. He's not your average Thanksgiving guest. Wild stuff, for real. Next time you pass the gravy, just be glad Turkey is not at your table. But it, I mean, it probably will be like Turkey, but like with the IE and then like the dude, whatever. Silent Night, Deadly Night, part two. This flick it's like Christmas with a horror twist cranked up to the max. It's part slasher, part wild ride down memory lane. So the movie's all about this dude, Ricky. He's the younger brother of Billy from the first movie. Remember Billy? The guy who went on a Santa Clyde killing spree? Yeah, well, Ricky's got his own issues. He's sitting in a mental hospital, talking to a psychiatrist about his messed up life. It's like story time, but with a body count. Ricky takes us back through his brother's story. It's a recap of the first movie, but with Ricky's own twisted perspective. He's all like, my bro had it rough, and now I'm carrying this psycho Santa torch. Homie's got a serious grudge against nuns and Santa because of his traumatic childhood. Flash forward to Ricky's present day and bro, he's about to lose it. He's walking around town seeing red of anything that reminds him of the past. And when Ricky sees red, people start dropping. It's like every bad Christmas memory triggers him to go off. Ricky's got this girl, Jennifer, but even she can't keep him from going down the deep end. The movie's got this vibe where you're just waiting for Ricky to snap. And when he does, it's a full blown Christmas nightmare. The kills? They're over the top and creative. Ricky's not holding back. He's using everything from car antennas and you guessed it, an ax. It's like he's dishing out his own brand of twisted holiday cheer. The movie's got some dark humor too. It's not taking itself too seriously, which kind of makes it more fun in a twisted way. Ricky's one-liners are as sharp as an axe, and the whole thing's got a campy 80s slasher feel. As we get to the climax, Ricky's fully decked out in Santa gear, ready to spread terror in the most unholy way. It's a showdown between him and the cops, and shoddy, it's as wild as you'd expect. Think holiday decorations meets homicidal rampage. All right, that's layer six over. Let's get into layer seven, Peter Rottentail. So peep this, we got this magical dude, Jonathan, who's all about his magical tricks. But bro, his act is not exactly pulling crowds. He's trying to make it big, but homie's struggling. On top of that, he's got this rival magician who's always one-upping him. Talk about a pretty tough gig. Now here's where things get real freaky, but not like that. During one of his magic shows, Jonathan tries this new trick with a rabbit, but shoddy, it goes all wrong. Instead of pulling off the trick, he ends up getting cursed and transforms into this grotesque, revenge-seeking bunny creature. Yeah, you heard that right. Dude turns into Peter Rottentail, a bunny from hell. Peter Rottentail is not cute or fluffy. Now this rabbit's got a thirst for blood and a grudge against anyone 
anyone who did Jonathan dirty. It's like a fluffy nightmare on a revenge spree. He's hopping around wreaking havoc and terrorizing the town. We're talking about bunny gone bad, real bad. The movie's got this low budget campy vibe, but it leans into it hard. It's like they know it's outrageous and they're all in. Peter Rottentail's look is wild, part rabbit, part monster, and all terror. He's hopping mad and he's not about to let anyone off easy. As Peter Rottentail hops his way through his hit list, the townspeople are trying to figure out what the hell's going on. I mean, a killer rabbit isn't exactly something you see every Easter. The kills are over the top, the blood is flowing, and the whole thing's a mix of horror and dark humor. The climax is about as bonkers as you'd expect. There's a showdown where the town faces off against this monstrous bunny. It's a battle to stop Peter Rottentail and break the curse, but this bunny is not going down without a fight. Peter Rottentail is a horror flick that's all about taking a childhood symbol and turning it into something straight up horrifying. It's a reminder that even the most innocent things can become nightmarish. Wild stuff, for real. Next time you see a bunny, you might just remember Peter Rottentail and think twice about getting too close. Easter Bunny, kill, kill! This movie's pretty cool. We've got this kid named Nicholas. He's got a tough life, dealing with a disability and all. But shoddy his mom, Mindy, she's all about making sure he gets a good Easter. She's a real one, trying to do right by her kid. But here's where things get all kinds of messed up. Mindy's got this shady boyfriend, Remington. Homie is bad news, like really bad. He's this low-life dude who's up to no good, and when Mindy's not around, Remington shows his true colors. He's mean to Nicholas, and it's just rough to watch. On top of that, Remington's got these two sketchy friends, and together they're planning to rob Mindy. Yeah, on Easter. Talk about messed up. Talk about BM, that's just rude. They think it's gonna be an easy score, but bro, they have no idea what's coming. Now get this, there's that mysterious figure dressed up as the Easter Bunny, but this ain't no friendly bunny bringing eggs and chocolate, nah. This bunny's got a vendetta, and when the bad guys show up, the bunny starts taking them out one by one. The movie turns into this wild revenge story. The Easter Bunny's going ham on these dudes and it's brutal. We're talking about some serious horror movie kills, all themed around Easter. It's like the holiday got flipped in his head and now it's all about payback. Nicholas is caught in the middle of all this chaos. He's just a kid who wanted a nice Easter, but now he's in this nightmare scenario. The whole thing's got this intense, gritty vibe. It's not just about the kills, it's about justice in a twisted Easter Bunny kind of way. As the night goes on, the Easter Bunny's just wrecking these guys. It's a mix of suspense and horror with a dash of dark humor. The climax is wild with a showdown that's got more twists than a basket of Easter eggs. Beaster Day. Here comes Peter Cottonhill. We're in this small town where Easter is a big deal, but shoddy, they're about to have the worst Easter ever. Why? Because there's this giant mutant Easter bunny, Peter Cottonhill, and homie is not about hiding eggs. He's about wreaking havoc and chomping on the locals. The town's got all these quirky characters, like a wannabe actress, a crazy dog catcher, and some local officials who are way out of their depth. They're all trying to figure out what the hell to do about this monster bunny. It's like they're in a B-movie and they don't even know it. They kind of are. Now the bunny, bro, is wild. We're talking about a creature that's part rabbit, part nightmare fuel. It's hopping around, causing chaos, and the attack scenes? Bro, they're so over the top, you just can't help but laugh. It's like a mix of horror and slapstick. Think giant rabbit paws and people running for their lives. As the bunny terrorizes the town, the movie throws in all these ridiculous plot twists and turns. The characters are trying all sorts of wild plans to stop Peter Cottonhill, but this bunny's got a mind of his own. It's a battle of wits, but with a lot more fur and fangs. The humor in this flick is on point. It knows it's a crazy concept and just runs with it. You got these cheesy one-liners, absurd situations, and a vibe that's so campy is gold. The movie is like a love letter to those old school monster flicks, but with an Easter twist. The climax is about as epic as you'd expect. The townsfolk band together for a final showdown with the bunny, and it's a mix of horror, comedy, and total madness. Think Easter egg hunt, but instead of eggs, you're dodging a giant rabbit with a taste for humans. Memorial Valley Massacre. This movie is like a camping trip turned into a straight up horror show. It's all about what happens when you mix nature, a creepy killer, and some unsuspecting campers. So here's what's up. It's been Memorial Day weekend and we got this new campground opening up. It's supposed to be this chill spot for families and friends to enjoy the great outdoors, but homie, they're about to find out they're not alone in the woods. Enter campground's manager, George Webster. He's pumped about the grand opening, but he's got his son, David, with him. And let's just say, their relationship's a bit rocky. David's not all about this nature life, but George is trying to bond with him. Family drama, bro. Now the campers roll in, all excited for some fun in the sun, but shoddy things get dark real quick. There's this wild man living in the woods, and he's not happy about these visitors. Think feral dude with a grudge against anyone who steps into his territory. The wild man starts terrorizing the campers. We're talking about some classic slasher moves. 
sneaking around, picking people off one by one. The campers are freaking out, trying to enjoy their holiday, but instead they're in a fight for survival. The kills are wild. The wild man uses everything from axes to traps, and the movie doesn't hold back on the gore. It's like every camper's worst nightmare. Imagine trying to roast marshmallows and then having to run for your life. As the body count rises up, George and David gotta step up. They're trying to protect the campers and figure out how to stop this wild man. It's like a father-son bonding experience, but like no other. The movie's got this gritty 80s horror vibe. It's not just about the scares, it's about the suspense and the whole man versus nature thing. And the wild man? He's like a symbol of nature fighting back in the most brutal way. The climax is intense. George, David, and the surviving campers face off against the wild man in a final showdown. It's a battle for control of the campground and it's pretty intense. Santa's sleigh. This is not your typical jolly old Saint Nick story. It's like Santa went from ho 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 to oh no no. So here's the wild twist. In this movie, Santa is not the friendly dude we all know. No. Homie's actually a demon who lost a bet with an angel, and because of that he had to be all nice and jolly for a thousand years. But shoddy, those years are up, and now Santa's back to his bad demonic self. The movie kicks off with Santa, played by wrestling legend Bill Goldberg, going on a rampage in the small town. He's got muscles, a mean attitude, and a sleigh pulled by a hellish reindeer. Bro, he's dishing out death like it's on the naughty list and it's wild. We get this teen, Nicholas, and his grandpa, who's a bit of an eccentric inventor. Nicholas finds out about Santa's real deal, and he's like, we gotta stop this guy. But who's gonna believe that Santa's out there wreaking havoc? It's a tough sell. As Santa tears through the town, the kills are over the top and crazy creative. We're talking about festive, but fatal. Santa's using everything from Christmas trees to holiday ornaments to take people out. It's like a holiday horror show. Nicholas and his grandpa, along with Nicholas's crush, Mary, are on a mission to stop Santa's reign of terror. It's a wild ride with them trying to outsmart demonic Santa who's just having a blast being bad. The humor in this movie is on point. It knows how ridiculous it is and just owns it. Santa's cracking jokes, the action's intense, and the whole thing got this campy, horror comedy vibe. The climax is as epic as you'd expect. Nicholas and his crew facing off against Santa in this big showdown. It's like save Christmas, but not in the way you'd think. They gotta put Santa back in his place and save the town from this holiday nightmare. Hey, that was layer 7, guys. Let's get into layer 8. The Ginger Dead Man. This movie starts off with this deranged dude named Millard Findelmeyer who's on a wild killing spree. But homie gets caught and ends up getting the electric chair. Sounds like the end, right? Nah, that's just the beginning. Millard's mom is all about revenge, so she mixes her son's cremated ashes with some gingerbread spice mix. Yeah, you heard that right. <laughs> She sends this cursed mix to a bakery run by this girl, Sarah Lee. Sarah's family was off by Miller, so it's kind of personal. Now Sarah's just trying to keep the bakery running with her mom and brother, but things get real twisted. They accidentally make a gingerbread cookie with a cursed mix, and bro, this cookie comes to life, and it's not sweet friendly gingerbread man. This is the ginger dead man, and he's got Millard's soul and his thirst for revenge. The ginger dead man, voiced by Gary Busey, is small but deadly. Homie is slicing, dicing, and cracking wild one-liners. The cookie's wreaking havoc in the bakery and it's up to Sarah and her crew to stop this pint-sized terror. The movie's got this vibe, this part horror, part comedy. It knows that it's a wild concept and it just runs with it. It's like a mix of Chucky and a holiday cookie gone wrong. <laughs> As Sarah and her family battle this demonic pastry, things get all kinds of crazy. They're dodging knives, trying to outsmart a cookie, and dealing with some real strange happenings. The climax is about as bonkers as you'd expect. A showdown in a bakery with a killer gingerbread man. This one's just funny. <laughs> Silent Night, Deadly Night. This movie starts with this little kid, Billy. He's got trauma about Santa Claus because he witnessed some real messed up stuff as a kid. His parents got offed by a dude dressed as Santa and that kind of thing sticks with you, you know? Wait, I think, I think I'm think i covering these in the wrong order. I think I covered the sequel earlier. <laughs> Anyways, fast forward a few years and Billy's living in an orphanage run by these strict nuns. But shoddy, they're not helping him get over his Santa issues. If anything, they're making it worse. Poor Billy has got Santaphobia big time and is all all kinds of messed up. Now Billy's all grown up and homie gets a job at a toy store, but bro, guess what? They make him dress up as Santa for Christmas. Talk about the worst job assignment ever for this guy. It's like a worst nightmare come to life. And this is where things go from bad to straight up bonkers. Wearing the Santa suit triggers something in Billy and he snaps and starts thinking he's got to punish the naughty folks. And in his mind, there's a lot of naughty people out there. Billy goes on a rampage and it's a full-blown slasher fest. He's taking out anyone he thinks is naughty and he's got a wild way 
deciding who's naughty or nice. We're talking about classic horror movie kills, but with a Santa twist. The town is freaking out because there's a psycho Santa on the loose and it's up to the cops to stop him. It's like a game of cat and mouse, but with tinsel and terror. The movie's got this dark vibe, is playing with the whole idea of holiday joy, but flipping it into something nightmarish. Billy's not just a villain, he's a victim too, all twisted up inside from his past. The climax is wild shoddy. It's a showdown between Billy and the cops, and it's as intense as you'd expect. Silent Night, Deadly Night takes the jolly old Saint Nick legend and turns it on his head. <sighs> Elves. This movie is straight up wild. It's like a mashup of horror, some whacked out sci-fi, and creepy elves. So here's the deal. We got this girl, Kirsten, chilling with her friends. They're kind of on the rebel side, you know? They do this anti-Christmas seance thing just for kicks. But shoddy, they accidentally wake up this ancient evil elf. And homie, this is not your cheerful workshop elf. This thing is dark and nasty. Kirsten's family, it's a whole mess. Her grandpa's got some deep dark secrets and her mom is definitely not winning any mother of the year awards. It's like the typical family drama, but with a sinister holiday twist. Now hold up, cause it gets crazier. There's this nutso subplot with Nazis. Yeah, you heard that right. Nazis trying to use this evil elf for some master race project. Wait, is this a The Boys reference? This is as twisted as it gets. Enter this dude, Mike McGavin, played by Dan Haggerty. He's like a detective turned department store Santa. Mike gets tangled in all this when Kirsten and her crew do their ritual at his store. He's like, what the hell did I just get myself into? The elf starts wreaking all kinds of havoc and it's super creepy. It's tiny but deadly. Kirsten, Mike, and their squad are trying to figure out how to stop this pint-sized menace. And the clock is ticking. The movie's got this gritty 80s horror vibe mixed with some off-the-wall sci-fi. The elf's out there causing chaos and Kirsten's learning about all these wild family secrets linked to this creature. The climax is crazy. Kirsten, Mike, and the gang face off against this evil elf trying to foil this Nazi plan. That's pretty funny. To all a good night. This movie's like a Christmas slasher wrapped in holiday lights. It's got that classic 80s horror vibe mixed with some Yuletide terror. So here's what's up. The flick is set in the sorority house where, like two years earlier, there was this tragic accident. A girl fell to her death during a Christmas party. Talk about a holiday gone wrong, shoddy. Now it's a Christmas break again, and the sorority sisters and their boyfriends are planning to have this big party at the house. But hold up, things take a dark turn. There's this killer in a Santa suit, and homie's not bringing gifts. This Santa's got an axe to grind, literally. As the party gets started, Santa starts taking out people one by one. It's like Silent Night, Deadly Night, but with his own twist. The students, they're all about the festive fun, but they don't realize they've got an actual psycho Santa in their midst. The kills are classic slasher style, creative, gory, and totally unexpected. The Santa's making a list and he's slashing it twice. As the night goes on, the sorority sisters and their boyfriends try to survive this nightmare before Christmas. They're locking doors, hiding and trying to figure out who's behind the Santa mask. The tension is high and everyone is a suspect. The movie's got this suspenseful build up. It plays with the whole who's the killer mystery and you're just waiting for the next jump scare. It's a holiday horror where the decorations are mixed with danger. The climax is wild, bro. The survivors face off against Psycho Santa in a showdown that's as festive as it is frightening. It's a battle to save Christmas and their lives. Oh, we just finished layer eight. Let's get into layer nine. Santa Claus. This movie's got this aspiring actress, Raven Quinn. She's She's trying to make it big in the horror scene, but bro, her biggest fan, Wayne, is obsessed. Not in a cute way. Dude's got a shrine and everything. Wayne's all about Raven, but his love is twisted into something dark and deadly. Wayne's also got this thing for dressing up as Santa, but homie, this isn't your cheerful ho 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 Santa. Wayne's idea of spreading Christmas cheer is offing people while wearing the Santa suit. Yeah, another killer Santa on the loose. Raven's out here just trying to do her acting thing, but Wayne's taking his obsession to the next level. He starts targeting people around Raven and it gets real messy real fast. The movie's got this low budget charm, you feel me? It's like they know they're not making a blockbuster but they're having fun with it. Wayne as Santa Claus, he's offing people in these holiday themed ways. It's like every kill's got a touch of Christmas to it. As the body count rises, Raven is caught up in this nightmare. She's got to deal with this psycho fan who's decked out in a Santa suit and wreaking havoc. The suspense builds as Raven tries to figure out who's behind the mask and how to stop him. The other characters? They're a mix of Raven's friends, co-workers, and some unlucky folks who cross path with Wayne. It's like a slasher flick with a side of Christmas lights. The climax is a face-off between Raven and Wayne. She's got to confront her biggest fan turned to biggest nightmare. It's all sorts of intense with a holiday backdrop and a killer in a Santa suit. The ginger dead man meets killer bong. Here's the rundown. We got the ginger dead man, that psycho killer cookie from the first movie. He's back and homie's still got a major chip on his shoulder. Or like his cookie dough. <laughs> but this time he's not just terrorizing a bakery. Now he's stepping up his game. Now enter evil bong, shoddy. Yeah, you heard that right. A bong that's alive and evil. This thing got some magical powers and a bad 
attitude. It's like your worst trip turned into a horror show. So the ginger dead man, he ends up at this head shop where Evil Bong's chilling. And bro, when these two meet, it's like the ultimate showdown of craziness. The ginger dead man wants to get baked, you know, in the oven, but Evil Bong's got other plans. The plot is wild, shoddy. We got these stoners and shop workers caught in the middle of this bizarre battle. The ginger dead man slicing and dicing and Evil Bong's trapping souls and messing with people's minds. It's a mix of slasher horror and stoner comedy all rolled into one. The characters are trying to figure out how to stop these two from wreaking havoc. It's like a race against time with a lot of trippy twists and turns. The ginger dead man's got his killer moves and Evil Bong's got her trippy magic. It's a weird, wild ride. The movie's got this campy, over-the-top vibe. It knows it's not serious horror. It's all about the laughs, the scares, and some serious what-the-hell-am-I-watching moments. Think of puppetry, special effects, and a whole lot of smoke. The climax is about as epic as you'd expect with a title like this. The ginger dead man and Evil Bong go head-to-head -head with the humans caught in the crossfire. It's a battle to see who's the ultimate bad guy. Or, like, bad object, I guess. Hey, that was Lair 9. Now, remember my friend who made this iceberg? I thought it's only fair that he explains the last layer. Also, partly because some of it I didn't even understand. <laughs> so, drumroll, please. Hey guys, it's your boy Jason Hopkin here, over from my channel. Uh, let's see what we have here. Treevenge. There are many words to describe the joy that a grand Christmas tree brings to a family. The particular words that come to my mind are bloodbath, vengeance, and brutality. Treevenge is a 2008 Canadian short film about Christmas trees taking revenge on people. If any of you viewers are familiar with the film Hobo with a Shotgun, please try to contribute more to society because you're obviously not doing enough as is. Well, basically, the same people made this film, and it's not very much better. Aside from the fact that people are getting torn to shreds by literal Christmas trees, the people somehow aren't that much better than the trees. I don't really know how you'd expect one of those things to move, but I suppose they move realistically, as realistically as something like that can be depicted. The film depicts humans in a very strange way, as they freak out and go berserk over cutting down trees. Like this universe's lumberjacks dance around like Leatherface when they cut down their trees. And to be honest, I probably would too if I was a lumberjack just for the fun of it. The film rides off of an interesting idea for sure, as it was interesting at least to see life from a tree's perspective. I say interesting very, very generally here. Yeah, I think some guy tries to have sex with the tree too. Oh, I'm the happiest Christmas tree, ho ho ho, hee hee hee. Yeah, um, let's just move to the next one. I, I don't feel very jolly anymore. A Christmas Carol, 1908. A Christmas Carol, the 1908 adaptation, is not a very well-known film, to say the least. This is, of course, unless you are a lost media junkie then maybe you stumbled upon this strange movie. The 1908 adaptation of A Christmas Carol was actually the very first American film adaptation of the book. This makes this piece of lost media even more interesting, as is an extremely rare film. This film is so lost that there are no known prints of it anywhere, making it extremely hard to cover. Now, I know what you might be thinking, but Jason Hopkin, isn't this just a regular Christmas movie and not a slasher Christmas movie? Well, technically there is no way of knowing what kind of content was in the film, as it was technically never released, so we can't try to assume what kind of film it really was. The only thing we have to go off of are little snippets here and there from the film. I'll leave it up to you people. Take a look at this screenshot from the film and tell me if it looks scary enough to you. Silent Night, Bloody Night. Silent Night, Bloody Night is widely believed to be the very first slasher film ever made. This is quite a hard point to argue as many of the more classic monster movies seem to ride on the line between general horror and slasher horror. There is no question whatsoever about what kind of movie this is. When I first saw this film, I was not expecting much out of it. Just the usual run-of-the-mill Bela Lugosi spookathon. After the first 10 minutes of the film, any previous conception of the level of terror this film would bring had been torn away from me as I sat in shock of the uncanny visual audio experience I was having. This film is probably one of the scariest pieces of media I have ever watched. This film is not cheesy, nor is it unrealistic. It is just terror in its purest form. I find it hard to get into the story of this film as any little detail would give away major plot points. 
and believe me, you have to see this film unspoiled. And yes, there is a very major reveal at the end of the film. Technically, there's two. This film is insanely ahead of its time as it successfully accomplishes techniques of horror that modern YouTubers such as the one that made The Walton Files are only just now discovering. Many scenes in the film are extremely distorted and strange, even pulling off elements of the uncanny valley for some of the flashback scenes. Shadows fill people's faces, leaving them looking like eyeless, mouthless corpses, shaking and swaying with inhuman delight. Another very interesting aspect of this film is its villain. The slasher villain in this film was not at all what I was expecting, as this is widely considered as one of the very first slasher villains of all time. So when I was watching the film, I wasn't very prepared for how scary it was going to be, and this slasher villain is definitely the main reason why it's scary. He utilizes the phone a lot in the film, and I don't really want to get very far into that, as if I explained it to you then it would spoil parts of the film. But let me just say, he does a lot of prank calls in this film, and when you see who it actually is, it is absolutely terrifying. This is not just a face reveal of a regular character, this is a face reveal that will definitely surprise you in more ways than just one. Hopefully your Christmas doesn't end as unfortunately as the victims in this movie. I hope you all have a silent night, but hopefully not a bloody night. Alright guys, that was the Holiday Horror Films Iceberg. I hope you all have a very Merry Christmas and a great holiday season. Sleep well everybody. Sweet dreams.